to the first BAMP of 2022. <laughs> Woo! Let's start the show, and I want you to please help me by giving it up for our performers tonight. We have Dallas McLaughlin. We have Keon Green. Patrick Mayuyu. Louise Julig. David Schmidt. Tim West. And our very first reader is going to be Vicky Chavez. So thank you, everybody. I wish I was going on later when y'all were a little drunker, and then my study would be funnier. Anyway, okay. okay. Oh my God, I'm gonna talk about titties. Okay, here we go. I like titties too. I decided to find a job during the summer before my second year in grad school. I landed at Hot Topic in my first ever retail experience. Well, it wasn't exactly Hot Topic, but rather the new sister store, Torrid, also known as the store that catered to fat, alternative, and goth chicks. And that's who they were looking to hire. And I just so happened to have been a fat goth chick. <laughs> It was an awesome place to work, and I was surrounded by confident, gorgeous fat girls with thick asses and juicy fat thighs and long, colorful hair. There was one significant feature, physical feature that I didn't have, and it made me stand out amongst my coworkers. I didn't have that one thing that is so beloved on fat goth girls. Big old titties. <laughs> I've barely been a B-cup since junior high, a status I am grateful for, especially as I get older. But on that sales floor, I was the only one not to have giant knockers. And it was remarked upon with some regularity. I didn't fit into the classic goth girl fetish. And quite honestly, compared to the lovelies that I worked with, I felt anything but feminine compared to them. Now, one day, while straightening up the store, I noticed these two guys following me around. They looked to be in their 20s, 30s, one dressed in an ill-fitting sport jacket, no tie, dress pants, and the other wore a polo shirt and jeans. So neither one of them fit into the store's typical customer base, and they stood out. They weren't really scary or creepy, but it was clear they were focused on me and not interested in any of the other girls in the store. I approached cautiously and asked if I could help them. They said, yeah, we're here to see you and make you an offer. We want to make a movie with you. <laughs> I was shocked that I was being propositioned. I mean, of all the girls in the store, why was I the one that they approached? Me, why me? But my curiosity outweighed my caution. They introduced themselves as a director and a producer that made specialized videos. <laughs> they were so courteous and well-spoken that I stood too stunned to say anything. They explained that they had noticed that I had lovely feet <laughs> and that I would be a perfect fit for their next project. I looked down and saw that I was wearing Converse and was puzzled as to how could they know what my feet look like? The producer explained that they'd been in the store a few days earlier and saw me wearing sandals. He went on to describe the sandals I was wearing, along with the color of my nail polish, the curve of my arch, the shape of my toes, with detailed accuracy. It was clear that he had studied my feet and committed them to memory. I was so confused, my feet, my feet? Why would they want my feet in a movie? The producer went on to explain that for a certain audience, feet were a huge turn on, and my feet were gifted. He stated that my feet were destined to be stars amongst foot aficionados. The high arch, the gentle curve, they were particularly lovely and in high demand amongst fetishists. I couldn't believe he was talking about my feet with such appreciation and longing in his voice. My feet. I'd never considered my feet beyond the fact that they were like 
big, but otherwise unremarkable. I finally asked the question I wasn't sure I wanted the answer to. What would I have to do? The director took over at this point, and he just started describing a variety of scenarios. Okay, so we get this kiddie pool, and we fill it with jello, and you like stomp around and squish it between your toes. We would focus the camera just on your feet so you would remain anonymous. Or we fill the pool with pudding, if that would be more to your liking. Butterscotch works particularly well. Or we could fill the pool with peas and you could smash them between your toes and we would do close-ups of them. And for each shot, we'll change the color of your nail polish, he explained, and perhaps have you try on a different pair of shoes and take pictures, you know, to put between the scenes. Okay, so far that doesn't seem so bad. He went on to describe another scenario where I would have whipped cream spread on my feet and then someone would lick them clean. Okay, um, another person would be involved. That's like prostitution, I thought to myself. I ain't no I asked, why would I want to do this? What would be the benefit to me? Well, we'll pay you $2,000 for like four hours of work. $2,000 for videos of my, my feet? In that moment, I went through a million scenarios, all of which ended in somehow it coming back to haunt me. Or worse, that my grandmother would find out what I'd done. Now, how my grandmother would find out that I'd ever appeared in a foot fetish video, I, I don't know. I didn't cross my mind. Just that somehow, some way, she would find out and I would forever be known as the puta de pies in my family. <laughs> the other factor was that I was in grad school for women's studies. <laughs> How could I, a burgeoning feminist scholar, allow myself to be objectified in such a way and still hold my head up? If I contributed to the objectification of women, what did that say about me and my moral center? I was still quite naive at that point in my sexual development. And while I didn't necessarily judge others for their sexual behaviors, I slut shamed myself something fierce and didn't indulge in pushing sexual boundaries when it came to my own interest. <laughs> After careful consideration, all within the span of like a minute, I turned them down flat and they were quite disappointed. The producer pleaded with me to reconsider as I had a true gift and one that could make me some good fast money. He offered, okay, what if we got rid of the food part and just filmed you, you know, like kicking a dude in a balls? <laughs> as a feminist, that should appeal to you. <laughs> It was at that suggestion I told him he had to leave. I mean, I love men and I appreciate a good set of balls. I could never bring myself to hurt a pair. Of course, once they left, I immediately regretted turning them down. I mean, I thought about all the books and tuition I could have paid with $2,000. The next fall when I returned to school, I began to take an interest in feminist perspectives of fetish and erotica. I found out that podophilia is the most common fetish of a non-genital body part. I came to understand how the historical act of foot binding in China was tied to the sexual aspects of the curved foot. I read everything I could on the cinematic history of nods to the love and adoration of feet, most notably in the works of Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> I've thought about the offer to appear in a fetish film from time to time, and ultimately, I'm glad I didn't take them up on it. If I was willing to do that for $2,000, what other things might I have considered doing for money? The path that such a decision would have taken would not have ended in a good place. That'll give you nightmares tonight, by the way. The best thing to have come from the whole experience was a newfound appreciation for my feet. 
I have come to value their beauty and their allure. And I take really good care of my feet. Pedicures, massages, special creams and socks, all in an attempt to pamper my most precious physical gift. I dated a guy who revealed after our first sexual encounter that he had a foot fetish and that my feet were extraordinary. Well, sex play with my feet did nothing for me, it was nice to appreciate a part of my body as being able to give pleasure that I had never considered before. My feet, yes, my feet are objects of desire and beauty, and I have come to embrace the truth of such a bold proclamation. Such realization has led me to feel lovely and beautiful in ways that I had never before considered. Even on those days when I feel ugly and unattractive, I can gaze down upon my feet and reminded that I am something special. So yes, while the girls I worked with at Torrid had some lovely, huge knockers, God, they were beautiful. Those south mounds that many a fantasy are based upon, I have my own lovely gift of physical perfection and beauty. My feet, my gorgeous, lovely feet that are worthy of adoration and worship. Who needs the hassle of big old chichis when you can have the stuff of every potophile's fantasy? Vite Chavez! Well, who else is turned on, huh? All right. <clears throat> fucking fuck. Fuck that fucking kid. This is what I heard as Jason kicked open the door to the green room, raced past me in a fury, and threw his sailor hat into his locker before kicking the locker door shut. Bad show, I asked. Fuck you, Jason replied, kicking the locker again, and this time putting a dent in it. He then hastily fixed a smudge of makeup on his face, grabbed his sailor hat out of his broken locker, and headed backstage for his next cue. Jason and I were both mimes. My, mimes at SeaWorld's Sea Lion and Otter Show. Jason had only been at the show for about a month, and he had finally had one too many run-ins with shitty kids. And unfortunately, kids were pretty much the worst part of the job. If you've ever been to SeaWorld and seen the Sea Lion and Otter show, then you've probably seen the guy who comes out into the crowd before the show and starts messing with everybody. Most people know them as Biffs, and for most people, it's their favorite part of the show. I was a Biff. I was your favorite part of the show. Jason had only been doing the pre-show for about three months. He was very physically gifted, quick, agile, strong. He wasn't a funny person, but he could sell the bits with his body. He was very similar to the guy who trained me to do the part back in 1999. Back then, the show had an island theme, and the pre-show performer wasn't a mime or a biff. We were called Juan Ho. I was hired after my audition where I did an impression of a roly-poly bug doing an impression of Shamu. I was 19, I came up with the idea in the parking lot before the audition, and it killed. The guy who trained me was one of the best pre-show performers there ever was. He was quick and wacky and agile, and he picked up immediately that I was none of those things. I was Buster Keaton to his Charlie Chaplin, the deadpan goof who could take a fall that looked so real it probably was. He once told me in rehearsal, you have an incredible gift that I don't have. You can make 2,500 people laugh just by raising your eyebrows. He was right. <laughs> Summers at Sea Lion and Otter were the best back in those days, before Blackfish and the brigade of misinformed minivan moms. We would do six shows a day, and every show would be filled to capacity. In a day, we would perform for about 12,000 people. That's some kind of eyebrow power. <laughs> we had an incredible stable of bits already put together through the years, like one, two, three. Bye. Bye. <laughs> 
We did a bit called Kid in the Moat. That's where you desperately try to convince a little kid to jump in the moat. <laughs> Build a family, where you grab someone's camera from the crowd, bring them up, and start grabbing random people from all over the stadium to be in their family photo. If you set up a white couple with a black kid, it always got a good laugh. If you put a black and a white parent with an Asian kid, utter pandemonium. The options were endless, and sometimes some people would do their entire pre-show, 15 minutes, just doing Build a Family. My favorite was always the blindfold. This is where you pick a guy from the audience. It had to be a guy. The audience hated when you did this to a girl. You'd have them stand in the middle of the walkway against the glass. You tie a bandana around their eyes like a blindfold, raise their arms in the air, and walk away slowly. Then you lean against the wall and do nothing. Then you leave the stadium. They just stand there like an idiot. It's great. For years, we had the freedom to try new things, improvise, develop new bits, and it was probably the most fun I'd ever had on stage. But now, a decade later, my legendary eyebrows were covered in white, and I squinted through show after show, reapplying my makeup every hour. The show switched themes to a submarine, and we weren't biffs, we weren't one hose, we were mimes, and it sucked. Like, really sucked. <laughs> None of us were trained mimes. We didn't know how to mime, and none of the jokes or bits we did were mime-esque. We never pulled on a fake rope, or got trapped in a fucking box, or rode an imaginary horse, or whatever it is mimes do, I don't know, because I wasn't one. I was a chubby comedian who could take a fall, and now all of a sudden someone said, put white on your face. Literally for this mime year, nothing changed in the pre-show, except now we had white face on. They were fine if we talked. It made no sense. But it did piss off kids. <laughs> Holy shit, do kids hate mimes. <laughs> and let's be fair, everyone hates mimes. You've never walked into a room and seen a mime and was like, hell yeah. Your first reaction was to hurt the mime. And the kids did. They would punch us, kick us, pour water on us, throw food at us. The first few times a kid kicks you in the knee, you just try to play it off and ignore it, because what a little shit, right? Their parents never cared, and most of the time they just laughed harder at that than anything else in the show. The fifth time you get kicked, you learn to fight back. Like I would take off my hat, dip it into the moat, fill it with water, and then dump it on a kid's head. The violence was never going to stop, so you developed ways to defend yourself that looked like it was a bit. As long as it looked like it was part of the show, no one questioned it. Dumping water on kids' heads was never officially sanctioned by SeaWorld, but the mimes adopted it quickly. If a kid walked by and smacked us, we'd steal their popcorn and give it to another kid or just dump it out. If they yelled something at us, we would grab them by the sleeve and walk them out of the stadium and then lash the door shut. The back and forth was a staple of the show, but you had to really hate the kids to sell it. We became mimes because we had a new head of entertainment. He was an idiot. His only experience in entertainment was that he played trumpet. He had worked his way up through the ranks at SeaWorld San Antonio, and they thought that maybe, just maybe, he could come in and give the shows a jolt. Spoiler alert, he did the opposite. He was a short man who demanded that his word was final and cared very little for what anyone else thought. You know, the best temperament for creative group endeavors. His terrible leadership was one thing, but his ideas were bad. I mean, hell, we were mimes all of a sudden. And after a few months of being mimes, lockers being dented, kids beating us while parents laughed, we decided it was time to revolt. Quietly, of course. It began simply enough. We tried to do actual mime routines, pulling the rope, the box, whatever. It didn't matter because we were bad at them and real mime bits aren't funny. <laughs> we stopped using the bandana altogether in favor of an imaginary one. The one, two, three magic trick and blindfold bits did not work as well. When we all got written up for deciding as a group that we should no longer wear white face, we should in fact wear no makeup. <laughs> it was decided that a member of leadership <laughs> One person got it, that's all that matters. <laughs> it was decided that a member of leadership would be out there to watch every show. So naturally, we took it further. 
Instead of no makeup, we put white circles around our noses and our mouths. One mime just did white makeup on his neck. I started to add facial hair to my makeup. <clears throat> More write-ups and none of us cared. Mainly because they couldn't fire all of us, but they did fire Jason because he kicked a kid. <laughs> we pressed on and began the greatest stretch of shows that were ever done in the history of Sea Lion. We called them the dare shows. In our dressing room, there was a whiteboard, and it was your job to write out a dare for the mime in the next show. Whatever that dare was, you had to do it, because we would stay after our shifts to watch and make sure. For example, for the entire show, you have to keep fake crying. For the entire show, you have to act like you have light stomach pain. For the entire show, you have to wear a woman's bikini top and never make reference to it. Mouth curse words when asking the audience to applaud volunteers. <laughs> Sit at the stairs to the moat and mime fishing for 15 minutes. My two favorite dares came near the end. I dared one of the mimes that for the entire show, they had to start a bit and then halfway through that bit, give up on it. No payoff, no reference, just give up and move on. It was perhaps the hardest I and the sound man have ever laughed. The other was when I was dared during a completely packed house to walk to the very top of the stadium and then walk down to the bottom by going through each and every row, acting like I was looking for a seat. <laughs> by the time I got to the bottom, the show had started. By the time I got to the office, I was told to go see our new head of entertainment. I walked into his office and he informed me that he would be imposing a new rule at Sea Lion. We would all have to do the same exact pre-show. No changes, no improv, no going with the flow. From start to finish, there would be a script and we'd all have to follow it or we'd be asked to leave the company. He'd seen the dare board and he wasn't having it. I said, I looked forward to what this trumpet player was going to write. Two days later, I saw his script. Lots of typos. What he didn't understand was that I, and as you can tell, am long-winded. I also don't appreciate people who don't know how to do what I do telling me how to do it. So I sat down and wrote a three-page email to every person in leadership in my department and in the animal training department as well, explaining why this idea of making us all do the same pre-show wasn't only a bad idea, but it was impossible. You don't have the same crowd 15 minutes before a showtime on a Tuesday in February as you might on July 3rd. If there was no one in the crowd, you couldn't do build a family unless you were trying to build my family, which was just me and my mom. <laughs> I had several examples, well thought out points in a history only a decade of doing the show could bring. The next afternoon, I was told the head of entertainment wanted me in his office before the nighttime sea lion show. We weren't mimes in the night show, so I had less prep time and could stop in his office for a little chat. And all chats with him were little. That's a petty joke, I know. But I'd also just wiped off a pound of white makeup from my chaffed Irish face. I walked into his office and sitting across from his desk were the other three bosses of entertainment. All under him, of course, but any one of these four people could have fired me immediately. They didn't. They sat. I sat. And that's when the head of our department cursed me out for the next 25 minutes. After the first profanity lay sentence, I looked back at the other three bosses who all looked like they'd just seen a ghost. They clearly weren't expecting this and did not look like they were enjoying it either. I had a notebook to take notes, but all I wrote down was dick. <laughs> he continued to berate me in my simple opinions. He told me I wasn't half as good as I thought I was. He called me an asshole several times, even going so far as to say that I had fucked up his vision for the show just by being there. He ended by telling me that if I wanted to give him my opinion on shows again, I could come to his office, close the door, and say it to, a face, to his face, because then we'd see what would happen. No one moved. No one said a word. Then he asked if I had any questions. I said, no, I have to go do a show now. I then stood up and pulled an imaginary rope to get out of the room. <laughs> 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 
I heard a giggle from one of the bosses. I then went down to the cubicle and wrote an email to the head of HR about what had just happened. I CC'd everyone in the room on it, except for the dick himself, and pushed send. I then went out and did perhaps one of the greatest shows I'd ever done. A couple weeks passed and I received a call from the head of HR. He wanted to ask me more about my email and have me come in to give an official statement. I was then called by the other three bosses who were in that room and told that they had also just given a statement defending me. Apparently, the dick had also written an email to HR claiming that I was the one who called him names and that I challenged him to a fight. He also assumed his underlings would have his back, but what he failed to understand was that he was a dick. He made every show worse in nine months and everyone hated him. After a few days, the punishments were handed down. I was suspended without pay for a week due to emailing all the people I did, and my work email access was revoked until further notice. <laughs> the dick, on the other hand, got to keep his email access. However, he was never allowed to be alone in a meeting ever again. And if he was, the door to his office had to remain completely open. He was restricted from contacting me without approval from my immediate supervisor, and he was never allowed to receive a promotion within the company ever again. The other three bosses got me a thank you card and had everyone in the department sign it. <laughs> a few months later, the dick went back to San Antonio and we had a new head of entertainment who announced that at the end of the year, we'd be changing the Sea Lion show entirely and would no longer be mimes. It was a small victory, but at this point I was done. When auditions for the new show were announced, I didn't participate. I quietly bowed out after 11 years on the stage and with white makeup dripping off my sweaty face. I still hosted other shows in the park, including Pets Rule, Shameless House to Douse, and some seasonal things, but I had no desire to go back to Sea Lion. That is until 2012, when they had to fire one of the best for something and asked me if I'd fill in for a couple of weeks. The show hadn't changed all that much, so I only needed a day of rehearsals. When the time came to hire a new Biff, they just asked me to stay on. I had just gotten married, we could definitely use the extra cash, so I said yes. I instantly had more, ex more experience at the show than anyone else involved at that point, and they knew all the stories, so they just let me do whatever I wanted. The show did stay a bit more structured than my original run, but overall it was just like being 19 again. Except now, I was in my 30s, and at the time weighed over 250 pounds. I was pretty old for a biff, a physically demanding job that always required jumping and dancing on a concrete stage while being completely soaked almost the entire time. You ran up and down stairs for most of the pre-show, and now you didn't stop moving for about 40 minutes, as Biff's had a very prominent role in the actual show now as well. After a few years and many nights of me coming home in tears because of terrible back pain, knee pain, or just general soreness, I had to finally call it quits. After 14 years, I had done the job longer than anyone ever had. I had done more pre-shows than anyone in history, almost 9,000. I was tired. I was too old. But instead of accepting my resignation, they asked me to become the boss of the Biffs, to teach and train the newbies. So I did, but not before one last show, my goodbye show. In 2016, I walked from the top of the stadium to the bottom of the stadium, going row by row, tripping over people, spilling drinks and popcorn, never saying a word, until I got to the top of the stage and for one last time said goodbye. Dallas McLaughlin, everybody give me a hand. Honey, we're pregnant. She's got this dreamy smile on her face, and she's got this pregnancy test in one hand. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Honey, we are? It's a Thursday night in beautiful San Diego, California. November 14, 2019, at 8.56 p.m., I got the news that my wife Jennifer and I are expecting a baby. At this moment, I realize my life will change forever and experience will be my number one teacher. Don't get me wrong, being parents and starting a family was something we both talked about and we both looked forward to, but this caught us by surprise. 
How are we going to afford a baby? <laughs> are we even ready? We're living in a single bedroom apartment, for goodness sake. So how do I make this work? With so many emotions, so many feelings, and all the tears of joy, realizing that I would be a father made me proud. I could hold my chest out a little farther and hold my head up a little higher. I am the man in my little book of coolness because I am going to be a father. Honey, wake up. We have a doctor's appointment to get to, Jennifer says. On our way to the first appointment, I am nervous. My heart began to beat faster. The palms of my hands are all clammy and sweaty. Jennifer and I sit in the doctor's office, whispering back and forth at each other. When the doctor enters the room. Today, we're going to listen to the baby's heartbeat for the first time, the doctor says. I eagerly look at the doctor as she examines Jennifer. She puts a glob of gel on her belly, then pressing slowly side to side with this very sophisticated wand-like instrument. She's looking for our baby's heartbeat. I'm looking up at the monitor and the doctor started looking concerned. So naturally, I get concerned. The whole room goes silent. Is the baby lost in there? Is there even a baby in there? She found it, the baby's heartbeat. That moment was so clutch to me. It was like the first man landing on the moon, like winning a Grammy award, like throwing the Hail Mary game winning touchdown pass in the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl. I hit the jackpot. It was that big. Our growing baby is looking normal and what a sigh of relief. From that moment on, I did my very best to prepare for fatherhood. I read a book titled, We're Pregnant, the first time dad's pregnancy handbook. This book teaches the do's and the don'ts, like to be gentle and kind because she may be very emotional. To never, ever, ever talk about weight. To be helpful and cook meals and keep the house clean for her. To compliment. Maybe it's something I should be doing all the time. <laughs> it was much needed preparation too, because I had no idea what the heck I was doing. For me, this was trial and error at its finest. One night I went up, went out to pick up some grub. <sighs> Welcome to McDonald's, may I take your order? Yeah, can I get two Big Macs, a McDouble, a McChicken with cheese, a 20 piece nugget with six barbecue sauces, two large fries, a large Sprite, and a large Coke. Anything else? Yeah, two apple pies. Thank you. I got the whole order right. When I return home, Jennifer looks at me and asks, um, where's the ice cream? I look at her like, what ice cream? I quickly learn to always get ice cream. After a long nine months, the big day arrives. It is Thursday, July 16th, 2020. I'm the photographer taking pictures and video of Jennifer walking into Sharp Mary Birch Hospital that day. We are so excited. The whole hospital seemed empty and we are not ready for what will transpire over the next few days. So we get all settled in for the night. I say, honey, the baby will be here in the morning. Jennifer smiles and lays back in bed. I watch from a short distance as the nurse welcomes Jennifer to the labor room. The room was huge. There was a whole nurse station set up next to her bed, another station that looked like a weighing scale or something. Jennifer seems nice and calm, but the nurse warned, active labor will begin in the morning. We're gonna be here for a while. So I set up my little bed it was like a bus stop bench, kind of hard, layered with a thin pad. I could barely fit on it. I lay there looking across the room at my wife and can't fall asleep for some reason. I was anxious and a little scared. And just to think, I wasn't even the one bringing a baby into the world. I couldn't even imagine how Jennifer is feeling, but it is sweet dreams for me. The morning came. Honey, wake up. 
It's around five in the morning. I woke up all groggy. Honey, how are you? I'm in a little pain, she says. She's in some real pain now. I look over at her and she's hooked up to all kinds of stuff. There's an IV in her arm feeding her pain med medication, you know, fentanyl. And a baby monitor is strapped around her belly monitoring our baby's heartbeat and the contractions. Jennifer is only experiencing the first contractions. Then the nurse comes in. Jennifer looked her square in the eye. Can I just have a C-section? The nurse responds like, we're going to try to make this baby come naturally, okay? Jennifer was hurting, and she wanted to get it over with already. As the first day passed, there were times when the baby's heart beat was too fast, and my wife was in excruciating pain. I stood there watching in silence while her whole body shook frantically like she was in an earthquake or something. My words meant nothing to her. I mean, they had what seemed like a seismograph machine measuring her progress. The, the request had suddenly changed from, honey, wake up, to honey, can you please stay up with me? I knew I wasn't getting any sleep that night, so I stayed up, doing the best I could to comfort my pain-stricken wife. I rested my head and fell asleep at some point that night, maybe around three in the morning. Honey, wake up. I look up at the clock and it's four in the morning. I took a deep breath and sprung up off the bench. Yes, my love, what is it? Is the baby here yet? Hold my hand, honey, she says. All she wants is for me to hold her hand. I am exhausted and deranged with worry mixed with the reality of being in the hospital. And I can see fear in her eyes. After 32 hours of labor, the obstetrician decides it's in our baby's best interest to consider having a C-section. That option was music to my wife's ears. Please, immediately, Jennifer says. 26 minutes later, we head to the operating room and the doctor is ready to take Jennifer in for the procedure. I feel a surge of energy and my nerves are jumping through the roof. I can see them wheeling Jennifer down the hallway. They took her away with all the medical equipment two nurses escorted me to the waiting care. As I stand there and wait all tired, I keep wondering, how is Jennifer doing on top of what will my baby look like? Finally, I'm escorted to the operating room. I instantly notice the refrigerator-like temperatures of the room and the bright lighting. There's a huddle of doctors and nurses hovering over Jennifer. A nurse guides me behind a screen that Jennifer head pokes out of blocking any visuals from our side of the screen of the operation. Hey, hi, she says. Then within seconds, I hear a faint cry travel across the operating room. It's my baby. Oh my God, and he's crying. I swear it was the cutest thing I'd ever heard. On my right, I have my wife, Jennifer. And on my left, I look up and there he is. Logan Hunter Green looking back at me with his bright big eyes. Two of the nurses wiped him off, calling me over to complete the traditional umbilical cord cut. I cut the cord perfectly. <laughs> I took a real good look at him. Logan is absolutely perfect. One of the nurses wrapped him in blankets and handed him over to me. I then walked him towards his mother and watched as he turned his head to listen to her voice. Hi, baby, Jennifer says. He clearly recognized her. I quickly carry my baby alongside the nurse to another room where she completes his vitals and weighing. Baby Logan weighs eight pounds, seven ounces, healthy. My head is in the clouds with our baby in my arms, my heart filled with joy. I feel totally complete. Our stay in the hospital, I probably got five hours of sleep, maybe, the whole time. I'm in full protective mode, the watch guard, the first line of defense. I had new daddy duties too. I changed all the baby's diapers, did all the swaddling, and cared for the new mom. I slept with one eye open and one eye closed every single night. On discharge day, we were all packed up and ready to go. And after a careful ride home from the hospital, Logan is, all, is home and getting all settled in. Being blessed with a baby has by far been the greatest thing that has ever happened. 
Every single day is an adventure with baby Logan. And honestly, things are just so different now. We even decided I'd stay home with our baby. So what do you know? Now I'm a stay-at-home dad. And the next five years of my life will be dedicated to raising my son, our first-born baby boy, Logan Hunter Green. Thank you. That is Keon's first time performing in front of a live BAMP audience at Wesselstock. Scavenging from my belongings with a flashlight, betrayed in disbelief in the middle of the night when I found the walls of my bedroom empty, void of all the artwork you tore down and discarded that took me so many years to build, I was confronted with an unwanted mosaic of cleaner, wider squares, an indication of things that once existed to give me respite from the horrors of adolescence. I sit here, surrounded by blank walls because of you, my eyes wander throughout this room, inconvenienced with dusty second-hand bookshelves and a particle board dresser you drag from the side of the dumpster as if Jehovah had left it there for you overnight. A treasure chest just for you to store all these watchtowers you attempted to force down my throat as you drag me door to door in a powder blue suit, too hot and stuffy to wear at four years old, and the white reflective heat of Jack Murphy Stadium among all of your peers. So I took my little pants off and may have embarrassed us both, but praise Jesus, <laughs> I, this sweaty little pondesol of a boy, was happy, and you were much happier still when I stopped crying. At eight years old, screaming, I don't want to go with you again to that congregation a convention of crane flower followers to watch the dramatization of Lot's wife looking back, crystallizing into a pillar of salt, the magic trick performed by the actors of the white linen sheet, blindfolding all of these witnesses. But the trouble is, I was confused because Jehovah told you to tell me we do not believe in magic tricks. And here I was, witnessing a woman disappearing, which is to say, you have lost yourself in this crowd and won't ever let yourself look back. And I don't know what compelled me to say that. I just didn't want to go. I just couldn't sit through hours in the heat with people I've never met, telling me the things that Jehovah doesn't want me to do. And I question you, how is it he can see me? And then you hiss with impatient tongue that the devil lives inside of me. And ever since then, I have always wondered how you could say something so terrifying to a little boy that once took solace inside of you, worried with sweat that this was true, kept licking my skin to see how salty I tasted. A little boy, afraid of the ocean, because that is where salt comes from. I wonder if this is where sinners go, after they disintegrate, after they've been sculpted into pillars or statues or figures of the false idols you shall not worship. The scripture state, if it isn't written here, you cannot gather to celebrate for Jehovah is the one true God. Your devotion must be exclusive. And this is where we live. In a four bedroom house with a bellowing husband serving his sentence at a 7-Eleven. Your oldest daughter who kept slamming her door in your face. Another daughter too young to have a daughter of her own a son who got his girlfriend pregnant under my bunk bed, and me wondering why this family that took so many years for you to build is slowly being sculpted into a rebellion against you, against attending what you believe this tribe I see in pictures inside dingy photo albums, a book of shadows from, a, from before I was born, the family I thought I knew, posed smiling in front of a lit up tree or my brother on Santa's lap or these friends of yours crowding our living room, open mouths, buffet style, smiles, laughter, no pamphlets, but rather presents and presents exchanged. I squint and claw at this evidence. Some photos won't peel away, hopelessly stuck to the binder page. Some photos missing, cleaner, wider squares indicating things that once existed. It appears you've left a trail of salt behind you. And I am jealous 
I am jealous of the life you led and all you held before I was expelled from your body. What made you follow this path of righteousness? Why do you forbid us to honor the day I was born? What moment triggered this ironclad chain? Is it me? Was it giving birth to me? Was I a mistake, an accident, a moment of his lust you had to see through until it ended, a passion you gave into, and now you are unclean? Do you feel dirty because of me? An eight-year gap from your previous son, the youngest, a baby oblivious of the teachings to come. Is this why you will never really see all of me when I am talking to you? Only to realize much later, as we sit in dad's hospital room, this gap tooth smile, this extra 20 pounds, this skin I scratch, these features on my face, this yarn you taught me to crochet, this clean and bright song I sing, these things I inherited from you have always been here. They have always existed. Like the unresolved silence, we're constantly drowning in this ocean that surrounds an island paradise. You keep preaching to us about this kingdom of elite, obedient observers who will not put their right hand over their heart who meet in a windowless room, who put on their best tie or their best skirt, who never get to talk about all the hurt we were, you were going to inflict on me if I didn't dispose of my sister's Christmas tree when I was 11 years old, filled with resentment as you accepted their gifts anyway, as I had to find the joy of unauthorized holidays in someone else's house, take the time to carve a pumpkin only to leave it at someone else's house, lie underneath the glow of a real pine tree and smile in someone else's house. Make sure to hide the sweet tarts, the issues of men's fitness, the pictures I took at my first pride parade, all in someone else's house, up the street, from home to home, from place to place. You know that thing we practiced when I was little to see if neighbors had found their way. And so I guess I have you to thank for that lesson, that it will always be up to me to find my own heaven that it may take walking hundreds of loathsome miles before I find contentment with friends who will take me as I am, a chosen family that doesn't live here in this room, stilted with its blankness, and a note you left on my desk in the summer of 2000 telling me I am not smarter than God, the, vamp the vampire slayer and Miss Jackson are not idols to worship. This is bullshit. I think I screamed his name in vain, loud enough for him to find me standing inside this literal dumpster of a life, crying because I am a teenage boy who owns nothing but the stuff you can't stop yourself from touching, every goddamn fucking thing that doesn't belong to you, you devil bitch. And I was tempted to thrash your wares about until they shattered. Stack a pile of all your watchtowers, your Sunday bests, your mother's sewing machine, your emerald dress, smack dab in the center of this hovel and strike a match and burn it to ashes. Let you feel my pain as a furnace combusts in your jewelry box brain. And I hate that you've never said I'm sorry because you believe Jehovah approves of this betrayal, content with your decision, even if it meant I wouldn't speak to you for a year, me. Your son, the one you gazed upon every day as I woke up and went to school and gallivanted until 10 p.m. because I couldn't stand the sight of you. A looming figure, prying into my drawers when I'm not looking, could leave her husband on his deathbed just because you're anti-blood transfusion, and there you go again, imparting your views onto someone who's just trying to live his life. Well, I'll tell you what, this life is mine. And what's mine is this childhood desk that faces a window overlooking a parking lot where my car is, where sometimes I sit sobbing into my quartz filled hands and I don't know why I was put on this earth. Will I ever be more than a servant to the roots I witness decaying before me? Who am I pleading to when I whisper, I'm tired of living here with these elders, the rest of the tribe left behind? If there is a God, could it be that he is punishing us for wanting to run? My sister always swollen and struggling. My sister always the last to know. My brother currently caged for defending himself. 
the broken old man who's like a siren at sunrise, who swallows me alive in my dreams. The orange flames that streaked across our backyard, burning bushes the morning before everyone's Thanksgiving. My mother, the one who witnesses found in a state of denial, sweeping away forsaken debris, even though the Red Cross told us to leave. What do I believe when I force the words, dear God, out of my exhausted mouth? If you want me to pray, whatever your name is, can you promise me a quiet place? Can you disarm these weapons, her judgmental missiles, her insensitive grenades? Can you just let her walk across the bridge rather than use what you've taught as a barricade? Do you have the power to turn back time? superimpose my image into those pictures of those party people laughing so I can ask her what happened before I was carved into a black sheep that has to carry the weight of all these things before I was scared of the sea. Can you nestle me against her chest as I listen for her reassuring breath cradled together in a waterbed? Can I build my own watchtower without her knocking down my door? Can you let us find our own way? Is there a way to rip through these thrift store curtains, crash through these, <sighs> crash through the slatted glass, tell that 17 year old to get the fuck out of there, he doesn't have to stand for that. Tell the little boy, the devil doesn't exist. And even if he did, you're stronger than him. Ride your bike to the beach. You don't have to be afraid. Get your feet wet. Jump right in. Swim. That was Patrick Mayuyu. Give it up for Patrick Mayuyu. Holy shit. <laughs> He's a great friend to people who don't mind ugly crying, everybody. <laughs> All right, you've been informed. If you have any questions, go to the website. And now we are going to kick off our second half. So please give your undivided attention to our first storyteller in the second half, Miss Louise Julig, everybody. <laughs> My 10-year-old daughter and I were making a strategic strike on the Carlsbad Outlet Mall to buy new sneakers when I saw him up ahead, a 20-something Greenpeace volunteer with a clipboard. <laughs> no eye contact, I thought as we got closer. I knew that if we made eye contact, I'd feel obligated to stop. Because I was raised to be polite, even to strangers, even when I feel annoyed. And if I stopped, I'd end up listening to his spiel and then have to explain that I did not want to sign his petition to save the Redwoods or whatever. The last thing I wanted that day was to get sidetracked. So I sped up. We were practically speed walking and had just managed to skirt past him when I heard him call out behind me. Maybe you'd be happier if you smiled more. Oh. <sighs> and I felt something snap inside. <laughs> All my life, people had been telling me to smile. When I was a kid and a teenager, I chalked it up to adults being annoying. But it kept happening. Once in my 20s, I was shopping at Mission Valley Mall, passing a small group coming the other way, when one of them looked up at me and said, smile, it can't be that bad. I felt a tightening right below my sternum. What the hell was that? Though the comment was wrapped in cheeriness, I felt like I'd just been chastised for bringing bad vibes to the mall. But I hadn't been in a bad mood. I was perfectly fine. 
at least before getting sandbagged. I could not understand why strangers seemed compelled to comment on my facial expression. One day, years later, I was complaining to another mother, a friend of mine from my daughter's school, about this inexplicable phenomenon. She laughed and said, Oh, you must have resting bitch face. <laughs> resting what? Resting bitch face. Haven't you seen that YouTube? It's hilarious. It's when your natural resting face makes you look bitchy. Look it up. <laughs> was that why I got so many comments? Because I looked bitchy when I was just lost in thought or preoccupied or insert any emotion here besides deliriously happy? <laughs> it was quite possible I did have resting bitch face. I remembered how in family snapshots, my father often managed, no matter what the occasion, to look like his best friend just died. <clears throat> I did wonder why he looked that way in pictures when he wasn't a glum person, but I got used to it. That's just dad, I think. I smiled in photos because it seemed like it was expected, and I was a pleaser. But when my face was at rest? And well, I guess I didn't know what it looked like. Maybe Dad had passed resting bitch face jeans on to me. A trait inherited from my Danish ancestors. the curse of the Danes. <laughs> so that day at the outlet mall with my daughter, when the clipboard guy called after me about needing to smile more, it hit a nerve. All the times I'd never reacted before were like water that had been slowly rising drop by drop by drop behind a dam of politeness. And this was one drop too many. The dam gave way in an instant, and I felt a full-blown wave of rage crashing over me. I wheeled around and yelled, You don't know me! You don't know anything about me! The clipboard guy was just standing there, but my eyes weren't really registering what was happening in front of me as my fury took over. I jutted my chin out and gesticulated with my hand, drawing an imaginary circle in front of my face. This is just what my face does, okay? It just does this. So you should mind your own business. Some part of me realized I was losing the power of coherent speech. I flailed my arm. I wasn't used to acting out. My body didn't know what to do. I was also becoming conscious again of my daughter next to me. <laughs> Wary. The way a kid gets when their parent has jumped the rails. And her mother had just gone ballistic. Then, almost as quickly as it had risen, my anger receded, leaving an aftertaste of embarrassment mixed with resigned weariness. Now I just wanted to get out of there. The guy had not been phased by my tirade, and all I had done was make a spectacle of myself in front of my daughter. She was a kid who kept her cards close to her chest, so I couldn't tell what she was thinking. I shot her a sideways glance. Let's go, I said, turning back around. We'd gone about another ten feet when I heard the guy's voice behind me. I love you. Oh. Asshole, I thought. <laughs> Careful not to say it out loud.
When I'd watched that YouTube video, it seemed to solve the mystery I had lived with all my life. I had a problem with my face. Strangers felt compelled to tell me to smile because I looked bitchy or maybe depressed. But it turned out there was still one more piece to the puzzle. A couple years ago, I mentioned these mall incidents to another friend of mine, telling him it made me want to punch the people telling me to smile. He didn't understand. He thought the comments about smiling were friendly and playful. Wait, what? Friendly and playful? I thought wanting to punch these people would be a universal reaction, but now I worried maybe it was just me. Was I being too sensitive? Then, finally, the last piece of the puzzle clicked into place. It wasn't that people were telling me to smile. Men were telling me to smile. I realized all the comments over the years had come from men. And the friends who understood how I felt, who got it, were women. One of them sent me an article about the sexism of telling women to smile. And reading about other women who were just as sick of this as I was made me feel so seen. <laughs> And I realized that this is not really about what is happening on my face. When you tell me to smile, it is not friendly and playful, no matter how jocular you think you are being. It's a command. A command that tells me your reaction to what I look like is more important than whatever I might be feeling a command that tells me I don't have a right to exist and just look the way I do. A command that tells me you think I owe you something just for being in front of you. I do not have a problem with my face. You have a problem with your sense of entitlement to make comments about my face. <laughs> I recently asked my daughter, now 23, if she remembered anything from the incident at the mall. Yeah, that guy was being an asshole, she said. <laughs> it was pretty uncomfortable in the moment, but I was also glad you said something, that you didn't just take it. <laughs> She also told me that even at that age, she recognized that people often assume she was in a bad mood based on her face because she's not very expressive. And it always bothered her. I did a quick mental inventory, trying to remember if I'd ever told her to smile. <laughs> Fortunately, I couldn't remember ever doing so. It's true that I often can't tell what her mood is, but I've learned to either just ask or let her be. She doesn't owe me a smile, and I tell myself, that's just my daughter. For the record, I am not anti-smile. <laughs> I love a good smile, when there's a reason for it. And I often smile at grocery clerks, waiters, people I pass on the sidewalk. If they smile back, I feel good. We had a human connection for half a second. If they don't, it doesn't bother me. But I read stories where women had been told to smile by random men after just visiting their mother with advanced dementia, after losing a job, after losing a brother to an overdose, and being told they looked too serious or mean and that they really should cheer up. So here's a public service announcement for guys who don't want to be assholes. 
If you see me out and about and I'm not smiling, you've got two choices. One, assume it's none of your business and leave me alone. <laughs> or two, if you truly want to spread a little sunshine, just give me one of your smiles. A genuine, authentic, non-creepy one <laughs> that acknowledges me as a fellow human being. And maybe you might get one back. That's Louise Julig, smiling on the inside. I've heard a lot of unpleasant news in my day. No, David, Sylvia doesn't want to dance with you. Your grandma just died. Trump just won Florida. <laughs> the worst news, though, came from a middle-aged Russian nurse. David, ложись на кровать, держи жопу и раздвигай ягодицы. Translation, David, you need to curl up in fetal position, grab both butt cheeks, and spread them apart. <laughs> When I moved to Russia in 2003, I didn't plan on getting penetrated with a rubber hose. I was there to save souls for Jesus. I worked with a Russian Baptist church pushing an agenda I had inherited from the most anal retentive pastors of my own home church. After a year in the town of Saratov, I became disenchanted with the evangelical savior complex. I wondered whom I was supposed to save in the first place. And what was the point of planting churches in a land that was already fucking Christian? <laughs> I became a maverick missionary and decided to simply get to know people and appreciate their traditions. I grew close to the Latin American medical students in Saratov. I started hanging around the local Catholic parish and drank beer with the Mexican nuns who worked there. <laughs> cool chicks. <laughs> I began to feel at home. Things were looking up. And then I got sick. Beware you who live in the age of COVID. Getting sick isn't just a matter of what germs you're exposed to. It's also about how well protected you are. I had already cavalierly tempted fate <laughs> for a year in Russia Total macho with no consequence. I embraced diseased homeless dudes. I slept on the ground in the woods. I ate raw fish and eggs. That whole time my immune system remained robust. The Russian mystery bug waited until my defenses were at their lowest to launch an attack. In April 2004, a year into my stay, I had to leave to renew my visa. The closest and easiest country was Estonia, a former Soviet republic. I spent a week hanging out in the capital city of Tallinn, drinking Pilsner in medieval castle walls and chatting with the locals about the Soviet invasions they had suffered. Meanwhile, the mystery bug sent sleeper agents into my bloodstream. Subversive guerrilla scouts building jungle outposts, waiting for the infrastructure to weaken. And weaken it did. After several days in Estonia, I learned my visa would take an extra week. I also learned that my bank account was empty. I wouldn't get another deposit until May. I was officially a bum in Estonia. <laughs> I packed up my backpack and moved out of the cozy youth hostel and into the less cozy public park. Now let me tell you, April nights in Estonia get very cold when you spend them outside. I put on all my socks and all my shirts, and still I shivered on the park bench. For nourishment, I gnawed on a salami I had bought earlier that week. When my Russian visa was approved, I used the last of my cash to take the cheapest possible transport back to Saratov, Russia. Hard, upright seats on a series of buses and trains that traveled at night across the wilderness. 
I was so relieved to get back to my apartment where I had a jar of Kopec coins I'd been saving. Pulled together, they equaled a couple bucks, enough to buy a loaf of black bread that would sustain me until the next deposit came in. Sleeping outside, poor nutrition, stress, my defenses were down. That's when the enemy attacked. I went to the Saratov Public Library shortly after returning to give a talk about foreign aggression in Estonia. All the while, the mystery disease rolled into me like a thousand red army tanks through the streets of Tallinn. I felt faint when I left the library. I walked home and I was drenched in sweat. I called one of the Mexican nuns who worked at the church. No mames, hermana. I don't feel so good. Spiritually? No, me siento de la chingada, hermana. I feel seriously fucked up, sister. So she sent my Colombian friend Fabiana to check up on me. Fabiana was in her second year of medical school. When she walked into my apartment, her mouth dropped, dropped open. Oh, you look like shit, David. Let's call a real doctor. A Russian MD from the public clinic made a house call and took my temperature. It's pretty high, he said in Russian, showing Fabiana the thermometer. But at least he's not at brain damage levels yet. No, pues, I murmured weakly. No, pues, menos mal, cabrón. The doctor looked over his glasses at Fabiana. Is he speaking in tongues? So I switched back to Russian. No, doctor. What's the diagnosis? Not sure yet. What color is your matcha? He asked, using the medical term for feces. Uh, lately, I replied. Dark, nearly black. His eyebrows went up. Black? Are you sure? I think I would know, Doc. He looked at the thermometer again, then at my pale face, and then at Fabiana. He might need hospitalization. I tried to fight it off on my own, but I failed. After a week of fever and delirium, my Russian friend Marina came by with a pot of borscht for me. You look really bad, David. How bad? Huyova, she said which literally means as bad as a dick. <laughs> I love Russian slang. So, are you ready to go to the hospital yet? I nodded feebly and mumbled a mixture of languages. <laughs> I'm ready for it, cabrona. So Marina called for an ambulance and helped me pack my things. The public hospitals here are pretty bare bones, she warned me. You need to bring all of your own supplies, bed sheets, plate, cup, everything. A battered old van showed up with a single wooden bench in the back. I sat on it and shivered and tried not to fall over on the sharp turns. We parked and Marina half carried me to the intake desk. The nurse looked me up and down severely. Russian nurses are very serious. You want to see resting bitch face. Get over there. <laughs> she handed me a, a large glass jar. I need a sample of your matcha, she said sternly. At your service, madame, I said in English. One fecal sample coming right up. She pointed at a door behind me. I walked in and I found a dark broom closet without even a toilet or a roll of toilet paper. Shit, talk about bare bones. How am I supposed to squeeze out any matcha in here? I positioned myself on the cement floor tripod style, and I held the jar underneath me, and eventually I had my sample. So I wiped with a napkin from my pocket, tossed it on the floor, and walked out, holding the jar. The nurse looked up, and her face transformed. She laughed, really laughed, big, heaving belly guffaws, very un-Russian nurse-like. And finally, she said with tears streaming down her face, that's not what I wanted from you. And that's when I learned that matcha in Russian actually doesn't mean feces. It's the Russian word for urine. (laughs) 
Marina gave me a sympathetic look as I stood there holding a turd in a jar. I tossed it in the trash, filled out my intake paperwork, and I said goodbye to Marina. I put the sheets on my bed, unpacked my things, and laid down to finally get some rest. Then a nurse walked in to take my temperature. Okay, I said when she left, now I can get some sleep. Ten minutes later, another nurse came in to give me an injection. Well, okay, now I can get some sleep. A minute later, two more nurses. I looked up. Now what? One of them held a floppy rubber, rubber bladder attached to a long tube. Oh, neat. It brought me a nutritious shake to drink. I smiled and held out my glass for them to serve me. The stone-faced nurse shook her head. Take off your trousers. I dutifully pulled them down, curious now. Okay, they must be here to wash off my legs with that hose. But where will the runoff water go? And your underwear. I push deeper into denial as I remove my boxers. Okay, they're just going to spray down my butthole to, to clean it. But still, where will the water go? I sat back down on the edge of the bed. The nurse huffed and said the dreaded phrase. Curl up in the fetal position, grab both butt cheeks, and spread them apart. I stared incredulous. We need to clean you out, the other nurse said unceremoniously. Standard procedure. <laughs> and in they went. <laughs> Sadimir Putin. Now, now, I can't claim to understand for one second the trauma of someone who experiences sexual violence. But I will say this, though. As I felt that cold water entering me, filling my insides with its foreign chill, just one thought filled my mind. Nobody should have to bear a pregnancy they didn't ask for. The nurse told me to bear my own water pregnancy for five minutes. I waited four and a half, then I pooped out the mess and returned to my cot, defeated and utterly empty, and fell into a black and dreamless sleep. The next morning, I realized I was in full quarantine isolation. My only human contacts were the nurses and doctors who came into my room for exams, questions, treatments, pills, injections, they launched a full frontal attack on the mystery disease. Day and night, they injected my ass with the best medicine Russia could offer. I'm not saying ass colloquially. Everything went into my butt. Suppositories, injections in the butt cheek, several more enemas. I don't want to make any psychological assumptions about the fathers of Soviet medicine, but they had some major unresolved butt issues. I couldn't complain, though. The medicine was working. I slowly crept back from the brink of death. When I got over the fever and the delirium, I realized just how boring an empty hospital room could be. There was no TV set, no books. One cot, one table, one chair. Food was sparse and bland, flavorless porridge for breakfast, watery potato soup for lunch and dinner. After four days, I wondered how long I could stand it. But then my friends rallied around me. The Mexican nuns went to my apartment to pick up a couple of books for my sanity's sake. Dios te bendiga, David, they called out to me from across the hall that separated me from the healthy. I looked out the window in my door and waved back. Mil gracias, hermanas. Son unas chingonas. You sisters are real badasses. Then my Nicaraguan friend Dorian put credit on my little Nokia cell phone. I texted Fabiana and sent her my parents' home number. Please call my folks. Tell them my butthole hurts, but I'm alive. <laughs> she texted back, will do, but I'm skipping the butthole part. <laughs> People brought groceries to break up the monotony of my diet. The Colombians brought tomatoes and cucumbers. The Russian Baptists brought a roast chicken. When a nurse said that it wasn't allowed, they did the Christian thing and lied about it. Oh 
They hid it inside a tin under a bed of mashed potatoes. I was touched by their effort. I bet they would have brought it inside their butts if I'd asked them to. <laughs> Marina continued to check in on me via phone and in person, as did dozens of other friends, Orthodox, Protestant and Catholic Christians, atheists, Jewish, Jewish folks, Muslim Tartars. I had come to Russia to save souls, and this community of people saved my life. I had come to teach people what to believe, and they taught me the only thing worth believing in, the deep power of love, real human love, fierce and loyal. They breached the walls of my quarantine for one simple reason I was in need. In doing so, they breached our self-imposed human quarantines of language, creed, and politics, and came together, working as one body. That's what saved me. In the end, it's the only hope of saving us all. Some people discover this transformative love at a time of personal tragedy, a natural disaster, or a death in the family. Me, I discovered this love in my time of enemas. <laughs> and it's still up inside of me to this day. That was David Schmidt. It is a regular practice in theater when theater is dark, unoccupied by audiences, as many theaters are now, to leave some small illumination in the venue. It's called the ghost light. If you go into most theaters, if you venture into one even today, you'd find in the black the glow of a naked, low watt, soft white or dull yellow bulb from a sturdy wire frame basket to protect from its chance, mounted atop an upright pipe, fixed to a metal plate on wobbly casters, trailing a dusty extension cord from center stage, off into the dark, to an out, somewhere in the wings. A kind of industrial strength nightlight. The ghost light keeps the first person into the darkened auditorium from stubbing their toes. Or worse, should they need to retrieve or repair or rehearse something off hours when the venue is unoccupied, as now or on what we call dark nights. Theater folk, though, like to say the ghost light is for the spirits of the dead, who are irresistibly attracted by the occasional live event, punctuated by long periods of peaceful contemplation, alone in the dark. The theater in Old Town home to a series of theater companies in the last half century, has a ghost in the rafters, what we call the grid. He goes by Charlie. He will play with the lights when you're on stage. They pulse. We even say the lights ghost. Or, at times, you can feel Charlie lurking about in the theater's dressing rooms, downstairs, in the basement. There where the I-5 snakes through downtown at 6th at Cedar, St. Cecilia's Playhouse, the sadly boarded up, defunct theater twice over, converted from a funeral chapel. The adjoining mortuary, the theater's dressing rooms, sheltered, when I worked there, an older homeless man a Vietnam veteran who lived in the crypt, served as the night watchman. The theater also hosted a ghost we called Top Hat. A shadowy silhouette, fleetingly spotted between actors and daylight, creeping slowly past the pale sunlight, lingering through the cracks of the door frame. The theater's rife with such tales. But I can tell you, I've worked extensively 
at both venues, multiple shows and companies, and I've been in those venues alone at night many times. I've never encountered anything. <laughs> Still, I know they're there. And I can tell you, truly, what can happen if you do not leave a ghost light? I was in my late 20s. A late arrival to the theater, but while I still had my hair, had quickly worked my way from publicist and literary manager and dramaturg to, uh, well, what I really want to do is direct. <laughs> I was mounting my first show, a dark night production, those weekday nights when our rented venue was not being used for the regular mainstay production. It was still light when I left the theater offices tucked away into the old carriage works between 4th and G. I had put a late press, uh, press release to bed. I'd be to rehearsal early. Autumn was just starting to get crisp at night, but it was still only twilight. That hour or so when daytime downtowners hasten home and the different denizens of nighttime downtown emerge. I made my way down the block to the venue just south of Market, a converted old Victorian in the gas lamp quarter, and let myself into the venue via the heavy wooden double doors. The doors opened onto one end of the lobby that staff had nicknamed the coffin, because it was painted black, made of scarred wood, oblong, barely bigger than a body, and it trapped the ticket-taking staff there to endure the seemingly endless night during their umpteenth experience listening to the muffled performance within. At the other end of the lobby, heavy black curtains draped across the doorway let directly onto the stage, stage right. From there, they could make out the four risers, uh, rows, not seats, chairs on platforms, rising in shallow half-circles in the black. Now, this was the only theater I ever worked at which did not have a ghost light. As the first staffer in, this meant I had to switch on the fluorescence, the overhead work lights located stage left, the opposite side of the darkened stage. This entailed creeping my way across the painted black wooden floor, letting the heavy drape drop behind me. Before my eyes, could adjust into the dark, I bumped into something. Single set piece, a large butcher's block, center stage. It had manacles fixed to it. The chains rattled slightly. From there, I, I made my way stage left to the light switch on the upstage left wall, which the set designer had managed to mask, treated to look like cold stonework in some dark corner of Glam's castle. The main stage show was the Scottish play, fans of theater superstitions will appreciate. And at that moment, my thoughts were wholly focused on how I was going to stage my quirky, fringy, romantic comedy set in a modern Manhattan loft apartment on Lady M's goddamn dungeon. <laughs> my hand found the stage left light switch, though... I had a strong sense of not being alone in the room. Like a low pulse. The feel of eyes on me, behind me. I, I turned slowly. I sensed the figure. A woman. White. I, I can't say why, even now. White dress, glowing white. I, I can't say. I neither saw nor heard, but fully felt this profoundly unhappy person telling me angrily to get out. My instinctive response was to stand a little taller and declare, I, I have to be here. 
allowed to, to an empty room, nothing stirring in it, nothing visible. It felt like a witless dog growling at the door when there's <laughs> nothing there, sport. <laughs> I chuckled to myself, feeling ridiculous. And I flicked on the light switch, went about my business. The show was great, thanks, <laughs> and thought nothing more of it. Until a week later. We had a production meeting early Saturday morning. Yes, a horror in itself. <laughs> this one <laughs> was at least lively and blessedly brisk because artists are busy and no one had time, especially not my artistic director and the production stage manager, responsible for both the main stage and dark night shows. We all worked alone in the rented venue, and this was our chance to compare notes. As Jenny wrapped the meeting at the venue, we all rose to leave when Maria, who had to stay after, cocked an eye at us and asked, have either of you seen anything in here? The three of us looked at each other, nodded slowly, silently settled back into our seats. Before anyone could speak further, Jenny suggested we all take a long moment to jot down what we each had experienced so we would not influence each other's perceptions. Jenny was sure it was a woman, though Maria saw only white. Jenny said she was sad, Maria angry. Audible to Jenny, who closed her eyes when she directed, visible to Maria, who hardly blinked at light work. There was only one thing all three of us agreed upon. Where the energy we all sensed emanated from. Row C, seat three. A week later, someone broke into the theater. It was night, a dark night, late in the runs, after the show, so no one was there. But I came by in the morning to talk to the cops. They had already apprehended the suspect. The cop reassured me. A heroin addict. They'd found Bob babbling nonsense and bleeding in the street a block or two away. And this cop was just finishing up the report. He walked me through the building. The man had wrapped his hand around his own ragged T-shirt, then bashed it through the glazed Westmeyer, uh, wire mesh reinforced security windows in the basement below street level. The cop showed me the small amount of broken glass inside the basement window and decided the discarded bloody t-shirt. I could see where the injured man had made his way across the dark basement. And then upstairs, very close together as he crept along the backstage hallway, trying the dressing room doors along the way. Smear. Blip. Blip. Smear. And then, rounding the corner upstage, left right there by the light switch, the intruder would have turned and seen or heard or felt and been overwhelmed by the wave, the, the cascade of immense misery and rage from whatever was occupying that third chair back and three off the aisle. The cop couldn't figure this part. Bloody handprints marred the stone treatment upstage left by the light switch, smeared red handprints up and down the white enameled hallway, away from the stage, back, back past the dressing rooms toward the steep stairway tumbling down to the bottom where a small but startling amount of blood beaded on the cold concrete floor. 
And then across the basement toward the window, a few widely spattered marks, blip, 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 blip. <laughs> and then a much larger amount of broken glass outside the window. And yeah. Yeah, the cop exhaled, kicking through the shards. He was pretty cut up, half naked, screaming his junkie drivel in the gutter. No property recovered of him. The cop wrote it off to the cement. But as even my most cynical friend, who had reason to know, pointed out, the heroin addicts don't go breaking and entering when they're high. They're looking for a fix when they do that, all right? So the guy wasn't high. Out of his gore, desperate? Sure, maybe. How many days without, how many days without food or rest or any sense of security? How many people have turned away from him? And how many people to turn to had he burned through? Stumbling around in the dark, already traumatized, lightheaded from the loss of blood, as another colleague, a psychiatric nurse, suggested. Hell, he might have imagined all kinds of things. A century ago, we later learned, when our city's stingery district swelled with gambling parlors and bar rooms and opium dens and other barely hidden vices. The Gaslamp Porter Theater, later Cafe Sevilla, now a pizza joint between Market and Island, had been that type of 10 cents a dance joint where for two bits more men gained access to the cribs, as they called the rooms barely big enough for a mattress, in the brothel upstairs. Later, we found a tabloid article in the old San Diego Sun from a century before. It was about a young woman, you might guess. Found dead in her bed clothes. They didn't say the color. One of the brothel's many inmates, as they were called, who was doubtless so miserable with her lot in life, she felt she just couldn't go on. The gas lamp porter was filled with stories like that. Is, is filled with stories like that. That quotidian detail of the wounded heroin addict sliced up screaming his agony in the street should be the most horrific aspect of my tale. But we've all witnessed as bad, or worse. Maybe just not in a theater. Ghost stories are to remind us of the real horrors, the ones so horrible we can't face them in the light of day, the ones we're too busy daydreaming romantic comedies and Shakespeare retreads to stop and acknowledge the ones we all look away from. The ghost light in a theater cannot be much comfort to the ghosts. But I've always been happy for the ghost light since. And when I come back to the theater, if I come back, I will go slow. I will be still for a moment. Before I set to work, I will listen better. Look at things that aren't easy to see. I'll keep a light on. The next time I see a ghost light shining from the stage of an empty, otherwise pitch black theater, I will stand tall and say, I have to be here.
That was Tim West, everybody! Yeah. Woo! Also, happy birthday, Tim West! So, what did you guys think of these pieces tonight? Yeah. They were all right, right? Thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Those were amazing performances. So, real quick, let's just give it up again for those performers. Vicky Chavez, Dallas McLaughlin, Keon Green, Patrick Mayuyu, Louise Julig, David Schmidt, and Tim West. I would also like to thank our volunteers for tonight. That was Jordan Coburn at the door and Adam Greenfield at our book table. Thank you both so much. Now, last thing. I said I would explain the $5 Jack and Coke special tonight, which I hope you all have been enjoying. So, this is the, the last thing I have to say tonight. Um, and I promise it's not an ask for money. We've already done that. Um, more. Yeah, do give more, please. We can always use more. Um, we are all here tonight, myself included, uh, because of one person. Okay, technically two, but so say Wales co-founder isn't here. Sorry, Jake, uh, we do love you. Uh, but that one person is Justin Hudnall. Um, <laughs> He, okay, stop clapping. You can clap at the end of this. Um, I'm kidding. Um, he has worked absolutely tirelessly these past 12 years to make San Diego something more than LA's vacation spot. Um, to make it a place that is known for its art, its creativity, its good works, and I think he's done that. Um, he has given up nights, weekends, and holidays uh, writing grants, mastering streaming technology during the pandemic. Uh, I heard a lot of cursing during that time. Um, and doing whatever he could to not only help this organization uh, stay afloat, but make it thrive. I first performed with VAMP in 2012. I grew with So Say We All, and I knew I had found my dream job with So Say We All. I love working with Justin most of the time. Um, but I tell all of you this because today is Justin's birthday. And he is not making a big deal out of it, but he deserves to be celebrated. So I am not gonna subject him to the awkwardness of uh, standing up here while we all sing happy birthday to him. I know he would hate me for that. So I am just, so I just wanted to tell you th that uh, that is why Whistle Stop is offering the drink special tonight in honor of one of his favorite drinks, the Jack and Coke. So, so, please do not get him totally slushed, but you know, feel free to buy a man one of those $5 Jack and Cokes. So, um, Justin, I love you, and happy birthday. Thank you all for coming tonight. Do stay, hang out with us, have a drink. Um, yeah, let's all party at the whistle stop.